The Gator of Gumbo Limbo, Chapter 7, The Red Feather. The burrow pit water was soupy with blue-green algae and hopeless to see through. Priscilla and I walked around it. We were looking for claw or tail marks Dejun might have made coming in and out of the water. No sensible alligator would come near this foul place, Priscilla finally said. The water looks absolutely poisonous and all of the plants around it are dead. The county's killing them to make a picnic park, I said, but it's killing lots more than weeds. I told her about the fish in the canal. You say the vultures ate the fish? Yes. Will they die from eating the PCP killed fish? I don't know, I said, horrified to think that it might kill not only the vultures, but gulls, raccoons, crabs, little alligators, everything that eats dead fish. I had wondered minutes ago if Priscilla was crazy. Well, I had my answer. She wasn't. I really don't think he's here, she said. So let's get back to Gumbo Limbo Hole and scare that old dragon away before Travis returns to look for him after his supper. He told a lady in the nature park he was coming back. He did? He's hunting him hard, Priscilla said. Well, that's good, I said. Dejun knows a hunter when he sees one and he hides. You think he's hiding, she asked. I do, but I don't know where. Under the slime, she said. Maybe he's here after all. Maybe, I answered. How long can an alligator hold its breath? If the water is cold, five hours, I read somewhere, she answered. But the water is still very warm. It's only December. Then he's hiding where there is water and air. Where's that? Right here in the burrow pit. When the water is low, you can see a cavern on the side of the pit. A cavern? Yes, I saw it last spring at the height of the dry season before the rains came and covered it. It goes far back and slants upward. The opening is underwater now, but the ceiling inside is high. There would be air in it. Priscilla walked to a large chunk of limestone rock that had been dumped on the shore by the pit digger. It's right down from this, about two feet. I picked up a stick and after swishing the algae away, reached back. There was a cavern. Let's gather Brazilian holly leaves, I said. For a trap, she asked. Of a sort, I replied. We'll scatter the leaves on top of the algae and if Dejun comes out of the cave to eat, he'll make a track through the leaves. We'll know he's here. That sounds like a good plan, Priscilla said. It was almost dark when we got home. Mom was asleep. The woods were quiet. I asked Priscilla if she would like some tea and lit the Coleman stove. Presently, James James arrived. Sorry I didn't meet you, he said. Any luck? No, but maybe. I told him about the cavern. How about you? The golf course does not use PCP, and I just checked the picnic area on the way home. The PCP could have washed into the canal. As I suspected, the levee's too high. We sipped tea, listening to the insects and an incredible mockingbird who was singing to the rising moon. There's a magnolia warbler in these woods, James James said. How do you know? Priscilla asked excitedly. The mockingbird is imitating it, he said. A magnolia warbler is rare. He leaned back and looked up at the night forest. Gumbo Limbo Hammock is one of the last islands for some of our most beautiful birds. And several butterflies, I said. There are two hummingbirds here that have never been recorded in Florida, Priscilla said. And then looking around to be sure no one, but we too were listening, she whispered, and a rare lignum vitae tree worth thousands and thousands of dollars. We lapsed into silence again. The owls began their courtship calls and the raccoons came down from the trees to hunt for crayfish along the shore of Gumbo Limbo Hole. I was offered a job today, James James said, breaking the spell. You were, I said, by the director? Yeah. Did you take it? No. Good, said Priscilla and got to her feet. Too many people working now. Good night, dear friends. I left my poetry out on the table. Those mischievous little raccoons will be tearing the pages if I don't get back. Thank you for the tea. And for the cold soup, I teased. You'd better bring it back and I'll heat it up. No, thank you, she said politely. I don't really want it. She hesitated in the darkness. Where did you say you put it? Priscilla rushed off in the moonlight, her dress touching the leaves of a bush that sent an explosion of sweet perfume into the air. James, James, I said when she was gone. I know what Priscilla does with those mini gin bottles. She has a purpose for them? He seemed surprised. She fills them with red sugar water and hangs them out for hummingbirds. James James whistled very softly. I sure had her figured wrong, he said. 
and she doesn't write poems to de June. At least she doesn't put them down on paper. He whistled again. As I said, I sure had her figured wrong. I didn't ask him what, what he had figured. It didn't matter now. If I had learned nothing else from nature, I had learned that once the butterfly steps into the light, it can't go back into the cocoon. We looked out through the trees and thought our thoughts. James James, I finally said, why didn't you take the job? You are really needed. I like helping out, he answered, but I can do a lot more for us by hanging loose. You take a job and someone above you tells you what to do. Your own ideas are squelched. I see, I said, but I didn't quite. James James got up and washed his teacup. I haven't seen Caruso since we met him on the road, he said. Have you? No, but he told me he had a big concert tonight at the old railroad station. He must be there right now. James James patted my head as if I were a child, and I resented it. What was he saying to me with that condescending pat? He stretched his long arms. I've got to get up early, Liza Kay, he said. The director wants me to look at the canal with him and his engineer, see if we can close it. A soft rain fell soon after I crawled into my sleeping bag. I lay awake, listening to the water drop through the oak leaves, sounding like the feet of those little tree lizards. Mom arose, dressed by candlelight, and leaned over me for a moment. Then she kissed me goodnight. When her footsteps died away, I thought about the job she wanted so badly and the young man who might get it. I thought about Priscilla and James James not wanting a job, and then they gave up trying to figure out people. I drifted off to sleep. Early in the morning, I awoke. I started thinking about the hammock. Rare birds and butterflies were here. The water of the solution pit was pure enough to drink. Gumbo Limbo Hammock was a rare and beautiful phenomenon, and Dejun was a big reason why it was. I would tell Travis that. He must not shoot him for that reason alone. Say that again, Liza Kay, I said, sitting up, and I did. Dejun, I said out loud, is the reason why Gumbo Limbo Hammock is beautiful. So he had to be there. He hadn't died or left. He was right here in Gumbo Limbo Hole. It was so obvious. The water was clear, all but a few spots of blue-green algae. The invertebrates were healthy, the fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals were happy, except for the armadillos, but they're in the pine lands. I see it, I see it, I said to myself. The clear, beautiful environment was saying, Dejun is in Gumbo Limbo Hole. I couldn't go back to sleep. In great excitement, I got up and dressed, though it was only 6.30. The great horned owl flew out of the oak when I moved the orange crate under it. Waving to him, I climbed to the top. The sun came up. The water turned silver and blue. The reeds came into view. Finally, I saw the beach. He's not there, I cried, and I had been so sure of it. Where are you? I snapped. I know you're there. The light brightened, and I saw that both patches of blue-green algae were gone, the one under the royal palm and the one on the side of the deep hole. Dejun must have bulldozed them up on the land. I would find them and at least show everyone the evidence that proved he was there. Scrambling down the tree, I circled the lake, concentrating on finding the algae. Suddenly, Travis appeared on Gumbo Limbo Trail. He was walking straight towards me. Taking a complete about-face turn, I tiptoed to the armadillo trail in the pineland and sat down behind a palmetto. I heard a soft grunt and an armadillo pattered out of the bushes and rolled. They don't seem to walk. Right past me. He stopped to dig into a fire ant nest. The ants crawled over his armor but could not penetrate it. Those that found his bare ears were easily displaced with a claw. I moved and he saw me. Sedately, he eyed me and rolled onto the pine lens. He could have hidden in the dense foliage of Gumbo Limbo Hammock, but he didn't. And then I knew why. A hammock is not part of your niche, I said to the odd fellow. You came from the southwest, where your ancestors fed on scorpions, fire ants, roaches, and tarantulas, in the pines and chaparral, never in a rich, moist hammock. It's just not your dish of oatmeal. That's why your trail ends at the hammock and not because the soil is tainted with salt. I was pleased. If you hang around the woods long enough, you will figure out all the answers. The next answer I wanted was the $100 one. Where was Dejun? The answer was there, but not quite there. I'm close, 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 I said, but not quite close enough. I've got to figure out what's going on before Travis does. He must be close to solving the mystery too. I ran back to my tent, picked up my rod, and met him on Dejun's beach. Hello, I said. You again, he said. I didn't expect to see you out here. But the gator's gone, I said. Where'd you hear that? I'm not sure, I answered. Oh, yes, someone said you got him. Well, I didn't, but somebody must have. He hasn't surfaced for a week. 
I cast my line. It plunked far out near the pit in the hole. Reeling in slowly, I watched the blinking water, wondering if Dejun was in that deep hole. It's cold down there. He wouldn't have to breathe very often. That was impossible. I had just looked into it from the tree, and he wasn't there. Did you hear about all the fish that were killed in the canal near the country burrow pit? I asked Travis. No, he said, but the director of the water management department left word for me to call him. I'll bet that's what it's about. He hires me to clean up messes like that. I'll check it out. Where did you say the dead fish were? I told him and then added, after you get beyond the prairie, just follow the turkey vultures. He picked up his binoculars and scanned the hole and then saw then the sawgrass prairie once more. Beats me, he said. I've been hunting for this guy for 10 days, and I haven't seen a keel or an eye bone. A poacher must have beat me to it. He fingered the gun in his holster. Thanks for telling me about the fish, he said, and walked off between the willows. I stood stone still until I was sure he was far away. Then I relaxed. Ten days, I said. Hmm. More proof to June's right here. Ten days is long enough for the hydrilla to grow masses, and there isn't any, and long enough for the clump of blue-green algae to spread, and it hasn't. Hello? I stared. Mother, are you all right? I froze. That same voice. Go 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 go. James James, I said as I recognized his call to Dejun. He had found our good dragon and was calling him. I put down my rod and pushed through the willows to greet him. He wasn't there. Hello, pretty girl. I looked up. On a tree limb sat a gray parrot. Well, I gasped in astonishment. Where did you come from? Do you want to go out? Hey, you're pretty wonderful, I said. Someone must meet with miss you very much. I picked up a stick and held it in front of his feet. He stepped on it and I brought him down to my face. Hello yourself, I said. The parrot cocked his head and pinned a black pupil in a yellow iris on me. The pupil expanded and contracted. You're a beautiful bird, he said to the white feathers around his eyes gleaming. I am, I answered. That's nice. I'm happy to meet you. Real, real happy. The woods are not full of people after all. I stroked the bird's beak, and he lifted his feathers to say he liked me. Thank you, I said. He stretched up his wings. His tail was carmine red. Caruso's hat, I said. It was you who decorated Caruso's hat. At last I knew where the feather had come from. Sidling along the stick to my arm, he walked up to my shoulder. He seemed content, so I carried him around the hole looking for blue-green algae. There was none we could see, but there was a mound of battleworks a water plant piled up by the alligator flags. Here he is, I caroled. He is here, but he also isn't here. Where is he, I said to the parrot, then put him on my hand and he stepped on it. I brought him in front of my face and looked at him hard. You know where he is, don't you, I said. Where is he? You're a beautiful bird. Night, night. You're a very fat, frustrating parrot, I answered. You talk, but you don't talk. I walked back to my tent with the bird on my shoulder. I was not going to put him back in the willows where I had found him. He was telling me something, something important that I hadn't yet thought about. Opening my bird book, I discovered he was an African gray parrot. The best talker of all the parrots, the book said. I certainly agreed with that. This bird could imitate not only people, but an alligator, or James James calling an alligator. Maybe that was it. He had heard James James calling to June. The old dragon hadn't roared since the last breeding season. The friendly parrot let me rub my nose against his against his beak, then nipped me gently on the ear. Go, 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 night, night, he roared. Good night, I repeated. Sir Bird, I hooted. You just solved the mystery of the missing alligator. I'm going to name you Sherlock Holmes. <laughs>